Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLA Step 1. My name is Michael Lloyd and I'm a practicing ophthalmologist in Utah. I'll be going through the microbiology section with you and we're going to start with Module 1, Introduction to Microbiology. We'll also discuss morphology and also bacterial structure. Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. We'll be doing Microbiology Module 1. My name is Michael Lloyd, MD. I'm a practicing ophthalmologist and I'm excited to take you through microbiology for your online review. Starting with Module 1, we'll go over the introduction, structure, and basic bacterial morphology. We're going to highlight the things that you need to know to score well on USMLE Step 1. Most important is that you recognize the type of major disease from presenting symptoms. You have to know the common causative agents of the disease, and you have to be able to determine the causative agent of a particular case from case clues. If there's no distinguishing clues given, you have to know the most common agents for bacterial pneumonia such not, or, or whatnot. You also will be given epidemiological clues, symptomatic clues, or organism information for a specific agent. Then you have to be able to answer the basic science questions about the disease or organism the predisposing condition, epidemiology, and or mechanism of the pathogenicity. You have to know basic science areas for microbiology and they will be tested on USMLE. You'll either be directly asked or you'll be needed to infer from clues. You need to know about the morphology. You have to know the gram reaction for every bacteria, the basic morphology, motility, for example in listeria, or spore formation. You need to know bacterial physiology. Is the organism an obligate aerobe or anaerobe? Some bacteria are distinguished by their fermentation patterns, and you'll have to know basic enzymes and specific enzymes for each bacterial pathogen. Also, you'll need to know the determinants of pathogenicity for each pathogen. You must be familiar with the toxins that different bacteria elaborate, which bacteria have them, and what they do. You have to be familiar with the factors that aid in invasiveness, pathogenicity, or immune evasion for each pathogen. And you'll need to know about intracellular parasites, those that are obligately intracellular, and those that are facultative. Other items which are high yield and frequently asked on USMLE Step 1 include epidemiology and transmission. It's particularly a favorite for organisms with animal or arthropod vectors, the zoonoses. You'll need to know how each major disease is acquired. Things to study for laboratory diagnosis include serologic or skin tests, You'll have to have those cold for syphilis and also the serology of different viruses like HIV and hepatitis B virus. You'll need to know the unusual growth requirements and sometimes they'll ask you about specific media for each bacteria, such as Thayer Martin media, chocolate auger, or Lowenstein Jensen media. Next, you'll need to know how these bacteria form and present in disease. They'll give you common presenting symptoms. There are some bacteria which present diseases in stages. So you'll need to know each stage of multi-stage multi -stage diseases such as pertussis, syphilis, or Lyme disease. You have to be familiar with treatment, or the, drug of, the drug of choice, or pharmacology, and prevention. You have to know about vaccination for, for specific agents, public health perspectives, and prophylaxis for exposed suspects. You also need to know when these, when these features are regularly used. This slide gives you a good breakdown of the, of the differences between the various different pathogens that we're going to be talking about in microbiology. Along the top you have viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Some things you'll want to draw attention to include the difference in size. You'll see that viruses by, by far are the smallest of the pathogens, and parasites, since their eukaryotic cells, are larger. The fungi and bacteria both are in the, around in the same range. Differences in cell type that are important to highlight is that viruses are acellular. They have no nucleus. They simply consist of some proteins, some DNA, and RNA. They require the host for all their, for all their metabolism. They use host enzymes. They use host energy. Everything is depending on the host. They use the host organelles and their obligate intracellular parasites. As such, viruses have no ribosomes. Bacteria, important factors about them, include their prokaryotic nature. They have a nucleoid region and no distinct nuclear membrane or organelles. They can be DNA or RNA, and their DNA replicates continuously, not like eukaryotes, which go in cell cycles. 
They have exons but no introns. They have no membrane bound organelles and so they require their cell membrane for all their metabolic activity. Bacterial ribosomes are different than eukaryotic ribosomes and that's a target for antibiotic coverage. Because they have different ribosomes we can select, we can make drugs which target them and help selectively kill them. Fungi and parasites are both eukaryotic cells. They have a nucleus and they have nuclear membranes. They can be composed, they have DNA and RNA. They, they replicate along a cell cycle, which is different from the bacteria, which are continuous. They have introns and exons. They have mitochondria and other membrane-bound organelles. And their ribosomes are slightly different as well. They have an 80S consisting of a 40S subunit and a 60S subunit. This slide continues to highlight the differences between these pathogens. In terms of cellular membrane, some viruses have envelopes, which they require, acquire from the host, and some are naked without envelopes. Bacteria have membranes, but they don't have sterols. Mycoplasma, which is unique among the bacteria, does have cholesterol. Fungi have membranes, and ergosterol is the main sterol. This is a target for antifungal medication, such as nystatin and amphotericin B. Parasites have sterols in their membranes, such as cholesterol, like humans do. In terms of cell wall, viruses have no cell wall. Bacteria have two main groups of cell wall types, uh, and peptidoglycan is the main com component of that. The synthesis of peptidoglycan is a target for penicillins and cephalosporins. Fungi have a complex carbohydrate cell wall, which we'll talk about in the mycoses. Parasites have no cell wall. Replication differences between these groups of parasite between these groups of pathogens include viruses make and assemble their viral components in the host. Bacteria reproduce by binary fission, and fungi and parasites reproduce such as other eukaryotes do with cytokinesis and mitosis. So much for the introduction. Let's move on to the next section, which is bacterial structure and morphology. You can see in this slide that bacteria come in many different shapes and sizes. If they're more round or spheroid, we call them cocci. If they're more rod shaped or bullet shaped, we call them bacilli. And then you have a few organisms which have their own shape. Spirochetes have an unusual mitochondrial associate, microtubule association. It gives them a wave-like formation. And vibrios are classically described as comma-shaped. The cell wall of bacteria can come in two main forms, gram-positive and gram-negative. And this slide has a depiction of the difference between the two of them. Take a moment and become familiar with the differences between gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative. We'll discuss about what makes an organism gram-positive or gram-negative. Looking at this figure, you can see that both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria can have a capsule. The biggest difference is the amount of peptidoglycan found in the cell wall. On this slide, we see a blown-up structure of the peptidoglycan between gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. You can see here in the gram-positive organisms, they have a thick, very thick and difficult to penetrate layer of peptidoglycan. Also, they have different tachoic acids and polysaccharides penetrating through the peptidoglycan. Inward of that is the cytoplasmic bacterial mem membrane, which is the cell wall. Gram-negative bacteria have a much smaller layer of peptidoglycan, and they also have an additional periplasma membrane. That's where you'll see the porins, and you'll see LPS projecting from that outer membrane. LPS is also called endotoxin, which is a key pathogenetic component for gram-negative organisms. Also, on the very inmost structure, you'll see that there is, they also have a cytoplasmic membrane where they carry out their oxidative metabolism and other, and other cell structures. Mycoplasma do not have a cell wall and therefore do not gram-stain. Discussing further the cell wall, the gram-positive cell wall has a peptidoglycan structure, which is shown here in this figure. Lysozyme breaks the beta-1,4 linkage between the NAM, or the N-acetyl muramic acid, and the N-acetyl glucosamine in both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. There is a pentaglycine bridge, which is found only in the gram-positive cell wall, as illustrated here with these five glycines in a row. The gram-positive cell wall is more extensively cross-linked than the gram-negative cell wall which is one feature of why it is so much thicker than in gram-negative bacteria. The gram-negative cell wall, in, in contradistinction, has a little bit different structure. 
It contains diaminopimelic acid, which is found both in gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls. But the gram-negative cell wall is not ext as extensively cross-linked as found in the gram-positive cell wall. Therefore, it's more porous, and it's also thinner. High yield on step one is the gram stain. They'll ask you frequently what agents you use, what order things happen in, and what the results are. First, you have to have enough bacteria to stain in order to have a positive result. Usually, you need at least 10 of the fourth organisms. The first step in the gram stain is to expose the bacteria to crystal violet staining. Then, Graham's iodine treatment causes the crystal violet, which has seeded into the bacteria, to precipitate. The third step is decolorization with acetone, and then you counter stain with safranine. What you'll have is a mixture of, of bacteria then. The purple bacteria are gram positive, the red bacteria are gram negative. The Zeal Nielsen's acid fast stain is more used for mycobacteria. The steps involved here include staining with carbyl fusion with heat. You have to have the heat in order to get past the waxy mycolic acids. There's a decolorization stain stage with acid alcohol. The modified acid fast stain uses a weaker acid to detect those organisms which are partially acid fast. And then you counter stain with methylene blue. All right, let's tackle a question which helps us understand more of our bacterial structure and morphology. The question is, gram-negative bacteria use all of the following mechanisms to evade the actions of penicillin except. And we haven't gone over penicillin yet, but it has a beta-lactam region and it attacks the formation of peptidoglycan found in gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So answer A, beta-lactamase enzymes. Answer B, porins. Answer C, molecular alterations of transpeptidase. Answer D, outer cell membrane. And answer E, thick, extensive cross-linking of peptidoglycan layer. From our review, it's instinctive to know that the gram-negative bacteria do not have a thick, extensively cross-linked peptidoglycan layer. That's found in the gram-positive membranes, in the gram-positive organisms. Gram-negative membranes do have outer cell membranes, and they can molecularly alter the transpeptidase to become resistant to penicillin. They also have porins to pump out the penicillin that gets in there, and they make beta-lactamases, which, in, which inhibit the penicillin and keep it from inhibiting the transpeptidase. That's it for Module 1, Introduction to Microbiology, Structure, and Morphology. Key things to remember which are crucial for Step 1 include the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. You'll need to know the staining reactions. You'll need to know the difference between a rod and a coccyx. And you'll need to be able to be familiar with the differences the bacteria have genetically than humans have. Up next, we'll go to Microbiology Module 2, where we'll talk about bacterial genetics.